Hello, my name is Shirley Severe Talon. I am the Application Support Associate for the MAVEN Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Manette Community Health Center for hosting today's session, Chronic Cough, a practical approach to a vexing diagnosis with Dr. Daniel Ray. Dr. Ray recently retired after 30 years in practice as a pulmonary and critical care specialist at North Shore University Health Systems in Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Ray was appointed Assistant Professor of, Clin of Clinical Medicine at the University of Chicago and was the Division Head of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at North Shore for 11 years. We are all so very thankful to have him with Maven Project as one of our volunteers. Dr. Ray, please begin when ready. Thank you very, very much. All right, so we're gonna talk about cough, which is uh, for a pulmonologist is kind of almost the bane of their practice, but also interesting in different ways. So uh, we'll go through it. It's um, frustrating as you know, uh, and oftentimes we're working with an incomplete data set. We're just kind of guessing at the diagnosis and, and um, that unfortunately is how we approach it. We approach it very empirically. So I'm just gonna provide a very practical approach to this. Um, I'll do that and I'll cover, as you can see, the young child here, probably with croup or pertussis. Um, and then we will, I will cover the pediatric chronic cough uh, towards the end of the lecture. Um, the no disclosures uh, from my, my part, uh, I believe this is worth an hour of credit. So that's nice. Uh, we're gonna review definitions of what is a chronic cough we're going to go over the um, cough reflex arc, the exceedingly long differential diagnosis of cough, and chronic cough, uh, pathophysiology, what would be a good diagnostic approach, and then treatment. Um, but since I know everybody is, uh, I was talking with Shirley, everybody's probably sitting at their desk, they're looking at this talk, they're eating their lunch, they're texting their children's teacher, and at the same time, they're answering the, their in-basket. So I'm gonna to get to the summary first, and then, we, and then we'll go into why the summary, you know, what, what's the rationale behind the summary. Um, and then we'll hit it again. So uh, by the end of the lecture, hopefully everybody will be good with this. So pearls for uh, evaluation treatment of chronic cough. So in the history, the things we wanna know, of course, is the duration of the cough because that affects what our differential is, whether the patient's a smoker, whether they're on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, whether there are signs or symptoms of an infection or sputum production, what are the triggers to the cough? What are their exposures? Um, you wanna ask what symptoms that might correlate with asthma, with gastroesophageal reflux, with pertussis, were they exposed again? Uh, and then importantly, we wanna be aware of uh, things that may make this cough more than just a cough. So signs of, of a serious illness, fever, weight loss, hemoptysis, dyspnea, um, uh, general malaise. The exam is mostly focused on heart and lung, but also uh, the oral pharynx. So a good look at the oral pharynx and in the nasal cavity. So it's really important to actually put the, um, use the ocular, uh, spec, uh, uh, spectrum and look up into the nasal cavity. Uh, it's amazing what you can see up there. Uh, you can see signs of sinusitis, of inflammation. You can see pale atrophic, but wet, wet membranes, you know, suggestive of basomotor rhinitis and, and so forth. Uh, the, based on that history and exam, you're going to and these were for people with coughs that have been going on for, for months, you're going to zero in on four major causes of chronic cough. So do they have an upper airway cough syndrome? Uh, so you think that the inflammation is located in the oral pharynx, the larynx, um, and likely coming uh, inflammation coming down from the sinuses or coming up 
with um, reflux, reflux from the upper esophagus into the larynx. So that's the upper airway cough syndrome. You're going to treat that with a primary antihistamine, uh, a decongestant, nasal steroid spray, and antibiotics if there's sinusitis, and see if it goes away. Likewise, if you suspect asthma, say that you hear wheezing or they have a history of asthma, or you see obstruction on spirometry, you're going to treat them with a couple of weeks of high dose inhaled steroids or uh, a combination of a long acting beta agonist steroid, uh, you know, the single maintenance and reliever therapy. The, uh, if you think that this is a reflux related uh, cough, that they have lots of GERD symptoms, you can put them on a couple of weeks of antacid therapy and reflux precautions to see if it improves. And then if they have allergies, but they don't wheeze and they have normal spirometry and you think that they might have this non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, again, we treat that with several weeks of uh, inhaled corticosteroid. So if there's no improvement after four weeks, we get a chest x-ray and then consider referral for further evaluation. So really this is the heart of uh, our treat our evaluation and treatment of patients with chronic cough, cough that's been going on for months. Uh, I'll get to the causes of, I mean, the explanations behind all this in just a second. Um, first, I wanted to go over the definition of cough because it really, it, it, your approach to the cough really changes depending on how long they've had it. For the patient, any cough they're coming to you with seems like it's been going on forever. Uh, but uh, we define acute coughs as coughs that are persistent up to about three weeks, subacute coughs from three weeks to eight weeks, and then true chronic cough is really a person that's been coughing for months. Um, a lot of people cough. So you, you see in the notes, about 10% of the population will have a, a cough uh, uh, that can be considered chronic a female to male ratio of two to one, and it tends to happen in older people. Um, so acute cough, subacute cough, chronic cough. So our approach is a little different. Our differential diagnosis uh, changes with this. The cough reflex, which is this marvelous little complex uh, system, includes uh, mechanical receptors, these are uh, vagal A apparent nerves, in the, mostly in the larynx, oral pharynx. They're sensitive to touch, displacement, uh, vibrations, and that includes the vibration you get with coughing, especially that harsh uh, uh, wall shaking cough um, can irritate these receptors and then lead just to more coughing. What I would describe to my patients is cough gets cough. Uh, you can also have vagal C fibers, which are more sensitive to things like cold and hot and acidity, irritation and inflammation and infection. Uh, these uh, afferent impulses are carried up into the medulla, the cough center, and there's a lot of cortical input into that, as you are aware. You can sometimes hold off a cough for a long time, uh, or you can force yourself to cough. The, um, the cough the efferent limb of the cough has this complex uh, inspiratory compression and then release um, to generate the cough. Uh, a kind of a schematic of this is uh, shown on the slide. The, re the cough receptors um, are mostly in the larynx and the um, sub uh, supralaryngeal area, so just the back of the throat and the larynx. There are the same cough receptors in the trachea and the bronchi, in the uh, ear canals and eardrums, even in the pleura and the pericardium. Um, so sometimes structures or irritation uh, in those structures um, will cause a cough. And then uh, in the esophagus, and that's really the crux of the gastroesophageal related uh, cough. So drip acid into the bottom of the esophagus and people will cough. Um, these uh, signals are carried up to the cough center, the medulla, there's cortical input to that, and then the, the coordinated um, response from the spinal motor and phrenic vagus nerves to generate the, the cough itself. 
So we talked about acute cough being three weeks, um, almost always a result of infection, colds, maybe uh, bacterial acute bronchitis or COVID. Uh, but you can also see acute asthma exacerbations and acute COPD exacerbations, uh, uh, an acute cough, uh, exacerbations of bronchiectasis, uh, a flare of the patient's chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, uh, even acute uh, CHF exacerbations can can present with an acute cough. The differential diagnosis of that uh, is much rarer, and that would include things like uh, reactive airway disease. And if you see my pointer there, reactive airway disease, TB, lung cancer, aspiration, foreign body aspiration, interstitial lung disease, sarcoid, pertussis, and the list just goes on for about 100 more entities. Um, but mostly we're, we're thinking about an acute, uh, infection, typically viral. Um, but if they're bringing up sputum, have fevers, et cetera, maybe an acute, uh, bronchitis or COVID. Subacute cough. Remember, this is a cough between three and eight weeks. Um, it's kind of the continuation of the acute cough into the subacute cough phase. And so it's mostly post-infectious. So this is the results of the cold that the person had and they haven't quite resolved the symptoms of the cough. Uh, you can think pertussis in this period. You often see the cough for pertussis developing after several weeks. Uh, COVID can leave people with a lingering cough for weeks afterwards. Same differential, exacerbations of asthma, COPD, rhinosinusitis, bronchiectasis can uh, have these kind of lingering coughs that go on for uh, many weeks. So um, the good news in this is that most of the time, or not most of the time, but a good number of, amount of the time, it will go away. So in one study that had 184 patients, subacute cough, so three to eight weeks, um, half of them had a diagnosis of a post-infectious cough and that resolved without therapy. So um, you don't necessarily need to do anything in that period if your patient's willing to wait uh, to see if it resolves, particularly if they had a preceding uh, viral respiratory infection. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, pertussis oftentimes will, um, the, the lingering cough of pertussis can go on for a long time uh, and may not become evident for several weeks. And then we get into the chronic coughs, the coughs that are there for months. Um, and there are four major uh, etiologies of this kind of a cough. And then when we can't diagnose this, there's the, the um, I don't want to say the garbage pail, the, the, the lack of a diagnosis that we label as a, a chronic persistent cough or a neurogenic cough. Um, and then that approach is somewhat different. But most of the time, uh, patients can be diagnosed with one or several of these um, syndromes and treated and uh, are improved. So uh, upper airway cough is a constellation of things that cause an inflammation in, uh, around the larynx and the uh, oral pharynx, mostly from uh, nasal drainage of one kind or another, infectious or uh, non-infectious, uh, allergic, um, but sometimes with uh, esophageal laryngeal reflux. You can have exacerbations of asthma, COPD that linger um, and are associated with a chronic cough, this non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis. So that, again, atopic individuals, normal spirometry, no wheezing, um, that have uh, a eosinophilic rich uh, mucus and eosinophilic inflammation of the airways and have persistent cough as a result. And then gastroesophageal reflux. Most of the time, people with chronic cough will have one of these etiologies, uh, but then uh, in this case, and well, there, the figures vary. This, uh, this note said 75%, I've seen, you know, 60%. 80%, it just it depends which article you read, um, have a 
a specific diagnosis or a combination of them, but then that leaves 25%, 30%, 40% that don't, and they end up with this idiopathic or neurogenic cough. So the um, just kind of drilling down on this, the upper airway cough syndrome, again, most often allergic, non-allergic, uh, vasomotor rhinitis, uh, chronic sinusitis, plus or minus this laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. So um, stuff in the pharynx, oral pharynx, uh, slipping down into the larynx, generating uh, mucosal inflammation, which then triggers the cough uh, reflex. Asthmatic cough, um, not necessarily associated with wheezing, unfortunately. Uh, or shortness of breath. Uh, often it, the cough may be triggered by things that might trigger their asthma. So seasonal allergies, uh, cold exposure, uh, dust, or, um, or an acute respiratory infection. Um, and then if you're lucky, their spirometry is abnormal that you kind of points you in the direction of asthma, but not always. So the spirometry can be relatively normal, but they're coughing. So uh, it's a very empiric approach. The best way to confirm the diagnosis is to go ahead and treat them uh, with inhaled corticosteroids or a combination uh, long-acting beta agonist inhaled corticosteroid for two to four weeks and see if their cough goes away. Uh, reflux cough is even more vexing because uh, people may or may not have symptoms of reflux. Um, if they uh, have symptoms of reflux and you treat them, they may not improve. Uh, and you can question whether or not reflux is involved in cough at all. Uh, so the diagnosis really becomes uh, a combination of uh, symptoms plus, plus a response to anti-reflux therapy. So if they have symptoms and no response to anti-reflux, it's pretty unlikely that the gastroesophageal reflux is contributing in a, a meaningful way to their cough. Uh, again, for that laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, um, that can be um, can be acid related if they're getting acid uh, reflux all the way up to the the um, proximal uh, esophagus. However. Um, not always, you can get bile salt uh, reflux all the way up into the upper esophagus. Uh, it can just be secretions, uh, but enough of it can cause inflammation in that area to generate the cough. So a trial of antacid therapy is uh, sometimes warranted, um, but it may not have much effect. And then this non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, another difficult diagnosis because who looks at that's putamine eosinophils. It is really hard. You probably have to do your own wet mount because uh, the lab won't do it and unless you're friends with a clinical pathologist and probably nobody else in the lab will do it if you ask. Um, but the diagnosis is suggested by eosinophils in the sputum uh, in a uh, non-asthmatic, so somebody that doesn't have wheezing or, or abnormal spirometry or history of asthma but they may have a history of allergies. Uh, this is treated with uh, inhaled corticosteroids, at least a, a trial of moderate to high dose for two to four weeks. Again, uh, you can make an empiric diagnosis if they improve, but unfortunately, as you see, uh, a large number of them remain symptomatic even uh, after treatment. Um, ACE inhibitors, you, most of the time, people have already picked up that the person's on an ACE inhibitor and stopped it. Um, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, chronic coughs are uh, on the basis of an ACE inhibitor. And typically, uh, if people start an ACE inhibitor, um, I think the rate of cough is about 20%. Uh, sometimes it's fairly modest and people will just live with it. Uh, other times it's severe and, and they complain to the doctor and, and change therapy. Um, but people can start an ACE inhibitor, not have any symptoms, uh, only to begin coughing three months later, a year later, usually uh, when there's some other trigger. Uh, for example, somebody is 
been diagnosed high blood pressure, put on an ACE inhibitor. A year later, they have a bad cold and they, they're coughing after the cold and then the cough just lingers and lingers for months after the cold. Uh, it, it's unlikely the cough's gonna go away unless you stop the ACE inhibitor. Um, there, if you read the patient ha uh, handout, it says that 5% of people with, that are placed on angiotensin receptor blockers have uh, cough, but that's actually the same as in the general population that there's five to 10% of people that have chronic coughs. Um, basically, uh, ARBs don't cause cough. Uh, ACE inhibitors do. You can substitute one for the other uh, while you wait for the cough to resolve, and that may take weeks. Um, there's some uh, clinical clues that I used to use um, that patients typically would have this scratchy, uh, itchy sensation in the back of their throat, and it was more common in asthmatics. Um, so I had a person on ACE inhibitors, they had these symptoms, uh, certainly it was worth a trial off. Pertussis, oh, pertussis is so hard to diagnose. The, unless you have an acute serology, a positive culture, you're always left guessing. Um, the, the best we can do, I think in the clinical realm is that they have uh, a characteristic cough plus some history of exposure to somebody that either had symptoms of pertussis or a laboratory confirmed pertussis. So if you have a, uh, a child parent, or sorry, a parent with a child that had a diagnosis of pertussis and then the, now the adult is coughing and they have this paroxysmal cough or they have, um, you rarely hear an inspiratory whoop in adults. Uh, but sometimes the coughs can be violent and then lead to vomiting. So those kind of symptoms would clue you in. Maybe this pertussis plus the history of the exposure. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, as you're well aware, unless you treat it early, you're not going to affect the course of the pertussis with antibiotics. So if the patient's been coughing for weeks and weeks, the antibiotics are really not going to affect that. Uh, it's mainly just waiting it out. Uh, and sometimes these costs are going for you know, two, three, or more months. They were chronic cough. So these are costs greater than eight weeks. The, the differential diagnosis includes things you normally expect, like chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, somebody with interstitial lung disease, uh, tuberculosis, or atypical mycobacterial infection, and of course, lung cancer. So Somebody that's got a uh, persistent cough, you haven't established a diagnosis, you want to make sure they don't have these things um, before we uh, assign them a diagnosis of idiopathic cough or neurogenic cough. Um, particularly be aware of things, smoldering, low-grade infections, fungal infections, myocardia, parasitic infections. If they have fever or weight loss or they're immunosuppressed, fatigue, they, their cough is productive. Any of those things are the warning signs that you need to investigate further. Um, when I go to visit my mother-in-law at the assisted living facility where she is, um, and I, I'm sitting in the dining room with her and listening to the aspirations that are occurring all around me uh, continuously through dinner, you realize that we aspirate a lot, particularly as we get older. Um, and uh, depending on how much and what's being aspirated, this can cause enough inflammation to generate a persistent cough. And certainly a uh, possibility of foreign body aspiration. So at the uh, ends of age, of the very young and the very old, um, foreign body aspiration is a real consideration, somebody with chronic coughing. Um, I have made a diagnosis of a perfectly healthy woman that had uh, was at a picnic uh, and they were eating corn on the cob and she choked. Um, <clears throat> and six months later, uh, I'm seeing her uh, at the end of a bronchoscope and there is a m huge granuloma formed around this uh, nidus of a corn kernel that's stuck in her airway. So uh, it can occur, just uh, you have to actually ask the question. <laughs> Did you have a bad choking episode with somebody about to do a Heimlich maneuver on you? Um, 
uh, to kind of tease that out. Um, chronic heart failure, people will cough. Uh, they're often on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors to boot. Uh, and then these rare things where there's inflammation of the uh, vagal nerve, either from a tumor mass or encroachment. Um, so uh, for example, a huge goiter with displacement of the trachea. Um, uh, people with massive tonsils that are inflamed. Uh, Arnold's reflex, so that's that uh, vagal reflex from the ear canal. Um, so I've seen chronic cough caused by uh, hearing aids, so particularly the ones with the really long um, internal component. So uh, if you have an older patient and they their cough, you can take out their hearing aid and put it back in. They, they're coughing a lot associated with that. You may consider the, um, the hearing aid as the culprit. People that are having ventricular ectopy sometimes will cough. Uh, and then there are a, a series of um, these rare, rare neurologic syndromes. So uh, this one, Holmes 80 syndrome, if you have never seen it. But if you have a patient that's looking at you and their pupils are asymmetric and they're complaining of chronic cough, and you say, oh my gosh, this is Holmes 80 syndrome. Um, and everybody will look at it, do it with amazement. Um, the, we talked about pertussis lasting for months, uh, and then um, sometimes patients can have chronic suppurative bacterial diseases. Haemophilus uh, influenza is one where you may not see an infiltrate on the x-ray. Uh, they may or may not have some sputum production um, or occasional sputum production that um, uh, sometimes can cause that persistent cough. COVID-19, uh, certainly People that have severe infections can have coughs that, that go on forever. Despite your best efforts, it, empiric treatments, uh, your diagnostic tests, chest X-ray spirometry, um, exhaled nitric oxide, um, you may end up with this, you know, a wastebasket diagnosis of chronic refractory coughs. So we really don't know what has caused it, but now that they have it, it seems intractable. Um, the, the typical symptoms would be this kind of that sense of irritation or fullness in the back of their throat, sometimes a shortness of breath, a lot of trouble with their voice. Um, and uh, in those patients, when we've gone through an extensive workup, uh, we will often uh, just try to suppress the cough. And we do that with things like gabapentin and amitriptyline. Um, so this would be a specialty uh, clinic evaluation and treatment. Um, I wouldn't do this from the primary care office. Um, once the, the patient is on that, of course, then you, you, would, be, you would manage it. To, um, and I, you know, at some point we try withdrawing the medicine and see if the cough comes back. So uh, complications of cough are, are uh, again, very numerous. Uh, I will just, this is a long list, but I can tell you the ones uh, that I've seen, uh, including uh, uh, patients uh, passing out when they're coughing. Um, certainly, you know, blood-filled uh, conjunctival membranes. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people have managed to cough out their IV lines uh, when they're in the hospital. Uh, headaches gastroesophageal reflux, worsening, urinary incontinence, a real common problem, coughing themselves into rib fractures, uh, pneumothoraces, um, uh, uh, interstitial emphysema in the lung, uh, pneumomediastinum, um, and uh, subcutaneous emphysema, all seen that with coughing. Um, coughing themselves to where they uh, are hoarse, uh, exacerbations of their asthma related to the cough. Uh, patients that are post-op, uh, post they can uh, rip out their surgical wounds. Uh, but mostly, it's just that the patient is miserable. They're changing their lifestyle. They're self-conscious. Uh, and it uh, decreases the quality of their life. So that's, that is the primary side effect of these chronic coughs. All right. So... 
how do we evaluate it? We're going to do this algorithmic approach. We, knowing the things that are most likely, uh, we're going to try to treat it, see if it goes away. If it does, and we're heroes. If it doesn't, uh, then we're not heroes, and we have to refer on. Um, so, uh, if we do our initial evaluation, um, don't you know? It is ter totally okay to uh, send them on for further evaluation. Uh, we want to exclude uh, underlying uh, diseases, obviously. And in our approach to the patient, um, we want to consider whether they have several things uh, going on simultaneously. So somebody with asthma that also has a post-infectious condition, uh, and maybe the, the combination of that has made their gastroesophageal reflux worse. So we're going to end up treating the asthma, the gastroesophageal reflux. Can't do very much about post-infectious and then see if they improve. Um, we're keeping an eye out for uh, signs and symptoms that suggest there may be something else going on. Uh, our exam, uh, as we said, we focus in on uh, the duration of the cough, their exposures, tobacco use, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, um, and then <clears throat> uh, when do we get a chest x-ray? We get a chest x-ray if you suspect anything other than a benign cough. So if they have uh, mucus production, they have agophony and they have fevers, you know, obviously you're gonna be getting a chest x-ray. If you have office spirometry and you're suspicious that they asthma may be involved in their cough, you're gonna do spirometry. And then we talked about pertussis where we're looking at both symptoms and exposure to try to establish a clinical diagnosis of pertussis. Um, we want to kind of uh, explore the patient, make sure that they're not uh, using illicit drugs, vaping, that they have some uh, occupational exposures that might be contributing to this. They work in a really dusty environment or they're exposed to particular chemicals. Uh, pets, especially if they're new pets or birds, uh, sometimes people don't consider birds pets. It's, so unless you specifically ask, do they have birds? Those, I don't know any pets. Um, and then uh, travel history and exposure. The, and, uh, there are many algorithms to uh, the approach to cough. This is the one from up to date. Um, so we're looking at uh, subacute and chronic cough. So coughs greater than three weeks. Um, we talked about their uh, history and physical. We're looking if they have postnasal drip, if they've got asthma, if they've got GERD. Um, and does the exam suggest anything going on in the lungs? Do they have vocal wheezing or agophony or dullness? Um, and then do they have infection, purulent sputum? Are they a smoker, antitensin converting enzyme inhibitor? Are they immunocompromised? Um, if they have a history that or physical that's suggestive, or quite frankly, I would do everything if, if they have purulent sputum, if they're a smoker, if they're immunocompromised, I, I start with a chest x ray. Um, if, however, um, they have, they don't have these risk factors, they don't have an exam that's suggestive, they just have post-nasal drip, they have an asthma, they have GERD, then I would empirically treat it. And if it gets better, we're done. And if it doesn't, then we get a chest x-ray. Um, if the chest x-ray is abnormal, then obviously we're pursuing the abnorm abnormality on the chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is normal, uh, then we're kind of working through those four big uh, causes for chronic persistent cough, um, or chronic cough, I should say. Um, and that generally means that we're treating them empirically with one or a combination. Um, if, it, if the cough resolves with that, then fine. If the cough persists, then they're off to specialty evaluation. So um, this is kind of the, the same uh, pulmonary pearls that we looked at at the very beginning of the lecture. So um, what are the therapies for cough? Well, they're actually pretty limited. We don't have a lot to treat. Um, but the upper airway cough syndrome, uh, usually it's a combination of nasal steroids, a primary antihistamine. So 
the primary antihistamines are much stronger and work much better. Uh, it's particularly since we're, we need to figure out uh, if we shut down the inflammation, does the cough go away? Um, so we use the nasal steroids plus primary antihistamine. Uh, and if they're, if we are suspicious of an infection, uh, sinusitis, then we'll treat that with antibiotics as well. Uh, and we do that for two weeks and see uh, is the cough improved or resolved. If we think there's asthma, then we talked about two to four weeks of an inhaled moderate to high dose inhaled corticosteroid. Um, Non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, again, uh, two to four weeks of uh, moderate to high dose inhaled corticosteroids. And then if we think that there's uh, gastroesophageal reflux or this laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, then uh, uh, lifestyle modification. So head of the bed up uh, plus antacid therapy for two to three weeks, uh, see if there's improvement. Uh, pertussis antibiotic therapy, if it's close into the onset of their, and if they're only a few weeks into that, uh, after that, probably it's not going to help. Um, once we've gone through this, these empirical treatments and we're, the person is still coughing, uh, and we've got a normal chest x-ray, uh, then we we're getting into this realm of, uh, unexplained chronic cough. Um, we've excluded everything else. And this goes under as many monikers, the chronic idiopathic cough, neurogenic cough, cough hypersensitivity syndrome, the, um, but these are just basically unexplained cough. And we're left with the, the goal of just suppressing the cough to make the person's life more bearable. Um, most of the time now we're using this combination of gabapentin, amitriptyline. Um, you can use these other uh, cough suppressants, although there's really no evidence that they're helpful in chronic cough. Uh, the one thing we don't use uh, would be narcotics uh, or chronic antibiotics um, to try to treat these chronic unexplained coughs. So back to our original slide. This is the the one slide. You know, what do I do? Somebody's been coughing for eight weeks. Um, and then, um, you know, we're go you're going to be able to successfully treat 60, 70% of your patients using this approach. 30% you don't, is you're going to end up referring on. Um, the referrals. Uh, so obviously, but uh, I think um, in your clinic, you may have trouble getting a specialty referral, or at least a timely one. Uh, then the patient may come back to you and say, I can't get an appointment for three months, you know, to see the pulmonologist. So um, what we do often, like uh, with our consults, is we'll kind of uh, preempt a lot of the diagnostic testing that the specialist is going, going to order, or at least we think they're going to order. So while we're waiting um, uh, on the ENT evaluation of upper airway cough syndrome, we might uh, get a, a sinus x-ray or a sinus CT. Uh, while we're waiting on the pulmonary evaluation, we're going to, we could do a spirometry or a pulmonary function test. Um, while we're waiting on the, the you know, the gastro uh, uh, GI referral, uh, we could do an esophagram um, uh, looking for evidence of um, uh, GI reflux. And then uh, if you have a Pathologists that will look at the uh, like a wet mount sputum for eosinophils and then certainly do that. Um, I would probably not uh, begin treatment with amitriptyline and gabapentin from in the primary care clinic. Uh, although if you yeah if you've gained experience doing that and feel comfortable, you can uh, generally start low uh, with the gabapentin and, and gradually titrate up so 100 milligrams of TID and then getting, working up to a dose of about uh, 300 milligrams, three times uh, <clears throat> uh, a day. Um, by the way, um, when you're coming off the gabapentin, you need to taper it down, not just uh, stop abruptly. Um, 
<clears throat> I believe this is, uh, yeah. So I've just included uh, the up-to-date uh, listing of all the different inhalers uh, in the low, uh, medium, and high dose um, uh, range. So uh, I know everybody's formulary is different, but um, and it really doesn't matter uh, which one you use as long as it's the medium or high dose. All right. On to the kids. So the uh, I it didn't treat children, um, so I don't have any firsthand experience with this. Uh, but you know, YouTube makes everybody an expert. So here we go. Um, chronic coughing uh, in children is defined differently. It's uh, defined as a cough lasting more than four weeks. Of course, the parents think that that's uh, an interminable cough, but that's the definition we have. Um, and it's pretty high prevalence, as you see, uh, 10 to 20%. Um, and for children, they divide these coughs into specific coughs and non-specific coughs. Um, the, and the differential for those are different and the approach is different. Um, the important questions for kids um, is one, do they have an underlying chronic lung disease uh, that's contributing to those coughs? Uh, is, is further evaluation or therapy even necessary? Uh, as you know, most coughs in children are self-limited. Um, and are there modifiable factors in the house, you know, particularly tobacco smoke, but maybe there's something else, uh, this, you know, the pets or the dust or the uh, mold, um, water damage, et cetera. Um, in children, the, the, the cough itself often helps kind of point in a direction. Um, so they have what they call specific cough pointers. <laughs> so this was, this was news to me. I didn't know about this. I mean, I, I listen to people's coughs, but in, um, but in children, they tend to be more specific. So they have wet and productive coughs um, that obviously point to infection. Um, um, bronchiectasis, sometimes uh, cystic fibrosis, wheezing and dyspnea, of course, are pointing towards asthma, uh, cough that's uh, new and onset after a choking episode, looking at foreign body aspiration, uh, coughs that occur in the neonate, uh, and particularly ones that are associated with other conditions are, are managed differently than uh, coughs in otherwise healthy children. So signs in these very young children uh, infants uh, would be dysmorphism, eczema, rashes, uh, obstruction of the nasal cavities, lymphadenopathy, uh, drainage from the ears, or just even things in the ear. Kids will do that. Uh, if you're looking back in the throat and they have massive tonsils, uh, if they have abnormal heart sounds, um, splenomegaly uh, on exam, if they're cyanotic, uh, we talked about the different sounds in coughing wheezing and, uh, and if the wheezing is focal. Uh, so uh, the thing I was learned from this is that unless you're uh, pretty certain it's a diagnosis of asthma uh, causing a chronic cough in children, so a cough greater than four weeks, uh, you're going to want to get a chest x-ray. So they talk about these classically recognized cough sounds. So the barking or brassy cough what we would normally think of croup. I guess most parents have heard that, uh, but it can also be associated with tracheomalacia uh, and these uh, tick or somatic coughs. Um, honking goose-like cough. Uh, again, uh, well, uh, we worry about tracheomalacia or somatic coughs. Uh, paroxysms of cough, of course, you think of pertussis um, and if you're, you know, as a bonus, if they have an inspiratory whoop, then you probably feel much more confident about the diagnosis. Uh, I didn't know about this, but apparently it's staccato cough in uh, infants uh, is associated with chlamydia infection. And then the kind of separative sounding coughs, the wet uh, coughs, particularly in the morning, uh, think about bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, uh, or an infection. Uh, the, the tick coughs, actually, uh, habit coughs, uh, just, um, you, you probably 
already know this, uh, if you can distract the child and the cough stops or if they, the parents say the cough only happens, you know, when they're awake, when they fall asleep, the cough stops, um, uh, kind of point towards a habit or a somatic cough. So um, the differential diagnosis of cough in children, the, by far and away, the most common thing is gonna be asthma. Uh, the next most common, or the other common thing is gonna be a post-infectious uh, cough um, or a non-infectious bronchitis. So these three things are the vast, vast majority of cough, chronic cough in kids. But other things can do it. Aspirations, particularly in infants where they have uh, uh, tracheosophageal fistulas or other uh, anatomic uh, disorders that lend themselves to aspiration. Uh, children with chronic pneumonias um, or cystic fibrosis, for example, uh, eosinophilic lung diseases, uh, foreign bodies, um, uh, mechanical inefficiencies. Are, so that would be the tracheobronchial malacia um, where the cartilage is not, is either uh, inflamed or uh, weakened and the airway itself uh, collapses. Um, that collapse of the airway, by the way, um, the vibration of the membranes against each other cause their own inflammation. So again, cough against cough. Um, the, oops, sorry. Apologize. Okay. Um, the other um, occasionally uh, can be cough in children can be associated with cardiac diseases and then medication, particularly if they are on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Um, so if you've evaluated a child, there's not a specific uh, cough that's identified, um, then you end up with this diagnosis of non-specific cough. Um, and that, again, non-specific, we don't know what causes it. Um, we do know that uh, a lot of times it will go away on its own. And therefore, uh, if the parent will let you, uh, if you can talk them into waiting for another two to four weeks, you should do so and see if the cough resolves or if they begin to develop uh, more characteristic uh, cough or some other sign or symptom of asthma, for example. If the cough, if the parent's not gonna let you do nothing for another month, then you could try a short uh, course of inhaled corticosteroids plus or minus an antacid uh, and see if the cough goes away. Um, the one thing that uh, they pointed out is that uh, over-the-counter cough suppression is really not recommended for chronic coughs. So these are for kids that are having coughs that are going on for weeks and weeks. Uh, don't uh, don't give them OTC cough suppressants. Um, and then obviously, if cough doesn't go away, then you can consider referrals for allergy testing for the pulmonary medicine, sinus x-rays, CTs, etc. But you're probably going to want to refer the child at that point. Um, same, this is also from up to date, the algorithm for evaluation of chronic cough in children. So these are the um, children that are presenting to you with weeks of coughing, four weeks or more. Um, you're going to um, look for signs of asthma. So you're going to do spirometry. If you have uh, exhaled uh, nitric oxide, do they have a history of asthma? Uh, are they wheezing uh, without Local findings, and if the answer is yes, then you're going to treat them for their asthma and see if they uh, improve. Uh, if you really don't have signs or symptoms of asthma, then you're going to get a chest X-ray. Um, if the chest X-ray is abnormal, uh, then you're going to um, look for the the cause of the abnormality. If it's not abnormal, then you'll kind of work through these other important things for. So foreign body aspiration, you know, do they have any history of uh, choking on something? Uh, do they have a focal sound in their chest, a wheeze? Um, do they have an area of atelectasis in 
Uh, if so, then you're going to um, send them on for further evaluation of possible foreign body. If they have um, um, <clears throat> um, cough that uh, can be modified by, you know, distracting the child, um, you want to try to make a diagnosis of a habit uh, or somatic cough, um, and you can proceed down this arm of the uh, algorithm. And but uh, if you end up with uh, nothing that points you in any direction uh, and the cough is persistent, then you're going to end up with the um, algorithm for management of a child with chronic nonspecific cough. So that's the, we talked about this, that's the waiting two to four weeks and then reevaluating. Um, if they're improved, fine. Um, if they are not, then they're going to need referral uh, for further evaluation. And that's um, the end of these slides. Um, I'm happy to take questions now. Um, so we go to the chat box first, I guess, and then open it up further. Yes, Dr. A, great presentation. There are a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. We do have one from Dr. Defendi. Uh, the question is, when is there a role for PFTs and patients with chronic cough? So the that's a, a great question. Usually um, spirometry uh, is sufficient because the, the um, you're you're trying to rule in or out asthma as a underlying cause for their chronic cough. Um, and um, most of the time, we don't need to do a complete set of pulmonary function tests, um, which are expensive and sometimes difficult to get. And spirometry will generally give us the answer. Having said that, once you've gone through that, you've treated them for asthma, they're not responded, uh, and you're getting ready to refer them on to pulmonary medicine, then yes, because you know the pulmonologist is going to order this and probably going to order a chest CT as well. Um, so if your patient's having to wait three months for their pulmonary appointment, go ahead. I would get the PFTs. I would get the Jesse T. Great. We also have another question. Can benzonatate be taken indefinitely for chronic cough? Um, that is a good question. Uh, so these, um, again, that's a kind of over-the-counter cough suppression. None of these have really been shown to be effective in chronic cough. So I would use it just in an acute setting for, you know, a week. I wouldn't use it uh, longer than that. I know some people get, you know, I don't want to say addicted, but they, you know, it's like, um, I don't think it ha it's helpful. So I would just limit it to a week's use and then, then stop. Thank you. Okay, and we have another one. What standard views for a CXR do you order? AP and lateral, or when would you order a PA view and lateral? Um, so if you have the ability to do a PA and lateral, that's the x-ray to do. It's just a better chest x-ray. If your clinic, the only thing you can do is you know, an AP viewer, it's a child, it's all you can do, then that's all you can do. Um, but a, a PA and lateral is your, your best uh, bet for a chest x-ray. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I am seeing right now. Of course, uh, just as a reminder that the CME survey will appear in a tab when you close out of this webinar. We really appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete this. Not only does this give you CME credit, but also help us to plan the best sessions for you. We share the feedback anonymously with the speakers and they greatly appreciate your thoughts. Yes, I do. Wonderful. Hopefully everyone enjoyed today's session. Within the next two weeks, the recording will be placed 
on our community portal under on-demand library with all of our other recorded educational sessions. Dr. Ray, I would like to say thank you and what a great presentation. Thank you all for joining. I see we have a few thank yous coming in the chat. Thank you, excellent, very insightful. I'm seeing. Oh, I, I want to thank you for all that you guys do in really tough. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I've always been impressed with the primary care and the, you know, just the, yeah, keeping it all together. <laughs> Opera. And and really, just uh, I mean, uh, the evaluation cops a good example. You're you're operating. You don't have all these tests. Uh, use most of the time you're operating based on your your history and your physical examination and your skills and knowledge and you know experience. And it, in the majority of the time, you're exactly right. It works out. And when it doesn't, it's not your fault. <laughs> As you can see, I. It was probably the most frustrating diagnosis I would deal with, uh, you know, day in and day out, as the uh, patients referred to me with chronic health. Great. Well, I would like to thank you all again for joining us today. I would like to wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you again, Dr. Ray. Have a good one. Thank you.